These are the people like Noshir Wan. We don't know what his religion was, whether he was a believer or not, but he was he's still known and recorded in the annals of history, human history, as a just ruler. Hatam Tai is the most generous person recorded ever. Rustam was a brave person. In the Greek mythology, we hear of a man called, named, uh, God called Prometheus, who, according to Ali Shariati, was probably the only person in the Greek mythology who had all the attributes that you can ever think of, attributes like virtues, just courage and bravery and generosity and giving away everything. And he was a Greek god who was punished by God's ears. So all kinds of faith in people. Ethics is something that's universal. Next, please. Now, ethics grew up over uh, millions of years. So, right from the time the sophists like Democritus, Terus, and Pythagoras, Pythagoras, everybody knows the Pythagoras theorem. They were the people who actually started the principle of ethics. But sophists were condemned by the later philosophers because sophists used to charge a certain fee, a tuition fee. So it was not encouraged by other people like great Socrates and Plato or Aristotle who did free of charge. The only problem with Socrates was, despite that he was such a great philosopher, all-time great, that he never documented a word. He used, to fit, he used to say, and it's mentioned in Plato's works, that writing means you're, you're actually disregarding the potentials of human brain. You should memorize it. And that is something which is very debatable. But Plato and Aristotle did it. Aristotle did the maximum work in terms of ethics, and his book called Nicomachean Ethics, which has been translated as uh, earlier, or as late rather, as so 1930s by Burton Russell, is worth to read. Next, please. And then you had Christian and everybody. I'll just go through them quick. Next, please. Socrates defined goodness as the greatest attribute, but Plato, I think, is the one who gave the best definition of virtue, and that is knowledge. If you have knowledge, then you can differentiate between good and the bad. And knowledge is the thing that really matters. Now, the, yeah, okay, we'll go on. There are different codes of morality which have been recorded in the annals of human history. The first recorded code was the Hammurabi. He was a Babylonian king, a very famous man. His code of conduct is still available, I believe, in Tokkopi Museum in Turkey, in Istanbul. And then Hippocrates Code is famous. It, most of us must have taken when we were graduated, at least I did. And then you had the Muslim Physicians' Oath came in 1980s at the International Conference of uh, Physicians of uh, Muslim Faith in uh, just outside Kuwait. Now, uh, Councillor Shabbat you mentioned something very interesting in that relates to my uh, discussion. The Islamic courses, the sources of Islam journal, that some all brothers in Islam is Quran, Sunnah, and Ijma and Qiyas. Quran and Sunnah, everybody agree. Ijma and Qiyas is very debatable, and we know what happened at Saqifa. That was Ijma and Qiyas. So Imam Ali al Islam, when he was offered at the time of uh, the birth of uh, Usman the third caliph, that would you follow the teachings or the, or the preachings or the sayings or the commands given by Shaykhain, he refused. He said, no, I'll use my intellect. I'll use my idrak, and I'll do research. That is how, next week, that is why we follow Quran, Sunnah, and Sirat Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, and Aqlu Idraq, and the most important thing is Ijtihad. Ijtihad is a fundamental difference between Shia Islam and religious scholars have been doing research for thousands of years. The first ever Ijtihadi school was established around 1100 years ago in Qum, then Najaf. And Hosea Ilma and Najaf is familiar to all of us, those who visited or those who not they know about it. And you would be surprised to know that Ijtihad did not start in, in Najaf and Kufa and Madina and, uh, and Qum only, but even Jam al Azhar. Next, please. Uh, we'll come in a minute. Uh, now, the Islamic sources are final divine uh, testament. Quran is the basic source of ethics for all Muslims, irrespective. We follow the guidance from that. Then, Prophet himself said that I have been bestowed to accomplish the moral values. This is the uh, Erwin version, Rasmus the last moment, Makarim al uh, Imam Ali is the perfect role model of the ethical principles, and Najib Balagha is literally a navigation system for ethics. The Qutbah, there are servants that are there in, in Najib Balagha. People are doing a lot of this. And a gentleman, uh, I think everybody knows Dr. Maulana Talib Johari, he told me only a couple of years ago that four more volumes of Najib Balagha have been published in 
uh, by Egypt, Alexandria University. There's so much material available, some it's not available to us at all. But Nahjul Balagha is a roadmap of normative principles of ethics applied in a day-to-day -day life. Next please. And then we have the whole series of Ayyumaya Thar. Imam Sayyid Sajjad al-Islam gave us the monumental Sahifaya Kamla, which is a book, book that you must have in your house. If you haven't, I urge you to have that. And in that, uh, there is a particular dua called Makarim al ikhlaq which is compendium on ethical principles. And last year, during the month of Ramadan, I sat down and did my own studies as a student of ethics to learn the lessons from dua and Makarim al ikhlaq as a human being and as a physician, I was surprised to know things that I'll mention in a minute. Imam Bakr al-Islam had his own academy in Medina, that is after Karbala and everything that happened. He had thousands of students, and I've recently come across a document which says that Indian philosophers, scholars, savants, pundits used to visit Imam Bakr al-Islam. And one of them introduced the word sifr, zero, to Imam Bakr al-Islam because Sifar did not exist in Arabic until then. Right from the times of Ptolemy and Pythagoras up to they, that day when the scientists were working as mathematical formula was developed, they had only between one and nine. It was a Hindu pundit who presented the gift of Sifar to Imam Bakr al-Islam, who then worked on it further and there are huge collections of material which are available, Imam Bakr al-Islam then introduced it to the Arab world and to the rest of the world. And that is how Al-Khwarizmi and other people were able to establish the astrolog and do all the research that went on afterwards. So Imam Bakr's contribution is immense and many people don't know about it. Then Imam Jafar Sajid al-Islam who got 36 years of peaceful existence, I have said, because Umayyah was going, and Abbasi were coming in, so he had some time. He established the academy, we had thousands of students came over there, and that institution lasted for about 36 years. He was a philosopher, an ethicist, a teacher, a mathematician, a astrologist, and a physician. He was the grandson of Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa Next, please. Now, I, the lesson that I learned last year from Dua Makarim Nafla, and I wrote an article on it and published in the IMI's Ethics Newsletter, sixth, second edition, and I would urge you to read it. It will be a, really uh, some encouragement for me if you read it and advise me if it was, was wrong there. Next, please. The basic lesson that I learned as a physician, as a human being, as a physician, is that near is the most important thing for a physician as well as any other person. If you have good intentions of doing a thing, you'll accomplish it. Allah will do your mother. Iman is the second important thing. We all know about this. Yaqeen is the ultimate faith, and Mawla Ali has given a full document which is published in Najib Balawan as a khutbah on Yaqeen. Ifrat al tafrit means that you should not be at the extreme, neither miser nor extravagant. You have to be in between the two. And the four principles of morality that Imam Sayyid the Sajjad al islam pointed out in Dua and Makar and the Club are universal. Piety, wisdom, courage and justice. And justice is the most important factor that I value about in a moment. Next please. And this, this is what I learned from Dua and Makar and the Club, that a physician should be honest, humble, modest, he should have taqwa. Knowledge should match skills. Imam Ali al-Islam said that if you have knowledge and no skills, it's almost akin to having a bow without an arrow. And then you should have the attitude, means morality, ethics and all those values. Serve with bearable ihsan, I'll talk about it in a moment. And you should be polite, you should have rage control, patient listener, effective communicator. These are the attributes that Dua has mentioned. To every human being, it's not for Shia or Sunni or Muslim, humanity that these are the characters that a human, a good uh, person should have. Next please. Now I then compare, to do a research, to compare with other, other uh, philosophies in Islam, brothers, Sunni brothers that are there, and they have the same things that you should have. Iman, and these are the references, say Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, and Sanai. These are standard Sunni books which we all uh, admire. Iman, Taqwa, Wisdom, that is Hikmah, Patience, Sabr, Humility, Tawbah, uh, Tawasu rather, and Modesty is Hayah. Next please. Islam's contribution is somehow, it is so sad to see what's happening in the world today. Islam's contribution is immense. After the decline and fall of the Greeks, 
when the Greeks and the Spartans, Athenians and the Spartans fought, and Spartans won and Athenians lost, Greeks almost lost the total value because the brain lost to bronze, and the Romans and the Byzantines and all came over. What happened after that, and this is what most historians write, particularly people like Will Durant, who are great writers, and Will Durant, I think, was from Scotland, that the, the world went into an abysmal darkness. There was nothing between the decline of Plato and Aristotle and things until the period of Renaissance, which is wrong. That is history which is wrongly written. Islam came in 610, and from 610 until 1492, when Andalusia was lost, Islam was bridging that gap in the human intellectual development, in sciences, technology, astrology, everything. I mean, Copernicus, when he discovered about the, the Earth being round, that was a replica, it has been proved, of the original Arabic work, which was done about 300 years before him. And then, people like Al-Hakim, who was the Fatwi uh, Caliph, he established Jama Zahra. That is what I was referring to earlier on, that it's not the Najaf or Qum only. Jama Zahra, which is now called Jama Asar, was basically a Shia Islamic fiqh and a research uh, center, very big center. And in that area is a maqam e Ras al Hussein and maqam e Sayyid al Zainab. That was all Shia area. The people had migrated in the times of Mahmoud and others, and they lived there. That Jam al Zahra uh, was then converted by Salahuddin Ayyubi the Kurd, because he was anti Shia, to Jam al Azhar. So this huge contribution which has gone under the uh, you know, the papers of history, which has to be dug out. People should know what uh, we have done. Then there was this man, Ibn Rushd. He was not a Shia, but still a supporter of Ayman and Abel. He introduced Aristotle to the West through Memonites, was a Jew, and Thomas Aquinas, a great philosopher that I'm sure you've heard of. And he, the, Thomas Aquinas, brought Aristotle from Arabic into German and other languages and to introduce to Europe. So the gap was bridged between the decline of Athens and 1492 when we had a, this is the list of famous philosophers who are ethicists, philosophers, historians, astrologers, and they had a huge contribution. I mean, who can forget al tabri or Al-Razi? Al-Razi, when he was dying, and this is an example of the importance of law. When he was dying, somebody came to visit him. So, said, Salaam Alaikum, etc. So Al-Razi said, well, uh, is, the man asked Al-Razi, how are you feeling? He said, I'm on my way up, but pray, pray for me. But don't worry about that. Tell me, have you solved the riddle that we discussed last week? So the man, the sheikh said, that, look, Al-Razi, you're going up now. Why do you care? So this is quoted in the book, that Al-Razi closed his eyes and said, I thought you were my friend. Even you want me to die in ignorance? <laughs> that is the importance of knowledge. This time. These are the followers of Muhammad or Ali Muhammad who have done that. And then you had, I can't say the same about al Ghazali. he was a very confused man. He was a philosopher, philosopher who condemned philosophy, became a Sufi, condemned al became a follower of Imam Sadiq al-Islam. And he died as a follower of Imam Sadiq al-Islam. And there's a famous book written by uh, Dr. Uh, a German lady who's written a book on Tasawwuf. She passed away recently. She had mentioned a beautiful story about how this man converted to I'm forgetting Dr. Anne Mary Shemel, Dr. Anne Mary Shemel, very famous scholar. She wrote a book on Tasawwuf, in which she mentions about Abu Dhabi. Next, please. Now we come to the actual normative principles and ethical stories, then I can talk about the topics uh, that we discuss, we'll discuss uh, in detail. Kant, Immanuel Kant, was a German philosopher. And I would like to cover Islamic and Western thoughts both together. Because like I said at the beginning, we're living in a multicultural society. We must have respect for all faiths. And that is what Islam teaches. The ontology focuses on duties and obligations. He was a great philosopher. And he said that reason should dominate emotions. And this is what Allah Iqbal also said. Urdu so reason and not emotion should guide. And the most important statement of Kant's philosophy is that means as well as the ends, both should be good. It's very close to Islamic thought. That you should do, you should employ good means to achieve good ends. Next please. This is the other theory, Benjamin Mills. 
consequentialism that sometimes you may have a wrong or less than good action, act, but if the results and the means are good, then you can justify them. And this is a theory that was used by Nazis in human experimentation by Dr. Mengel. That in order to save millions, they were doing experiments on only a few, and you cannot condone that. Nobody condones it. And this is also the theory that people are using these days on animal experimentation, and people who are pro-life supporters and uh, against the animal atrocities, they don't like this theory, but still being used by a lot. Okay, next please. Virtue theory is the oldest. It has stood the test of time. It was introduced by Aristotle, and it means that some people are born virtuous, and this is where I've written one, one of my articles, the concept of masumiyat, asmat, is as old as that. It's not new to Shia faith. If you're born virtuous, then you cannot do wrong things. Elevated as are born virtuous, and this is our belief, they were masum. They were masum because God had given them divine power to do good things. And this theory is being revived again by Professor McIntyre in the modern times. Next, please. This quality, uh, I've already spoken. Next, please. Now, the Islamic moral code in Quran is given in various places. It's called Amr bil Maruf wa Nahi an al Munkar. It has been translated by different people in different ways. Abdullah Yusuf Ali has given this translation Bid good, forbid evil. Professor Ahmad Ali, another good uh, translation says, Enjoin good, forbid evil. And this is a universal formula. All religion, all faiths, all philosophies will say the same thing. Nobody will can except for Machiavelli and Nietzsche. There were only two controversial philosophers who somehow said that, I mean like Machiavelli, you know about Machiavelli, he wrote this book called Prince, that sometimes it's good for a king to be evil, like constitutionalism, that you may be able to do good things, which is not accepted to a lot of people. This was also the mission statement of Imam Hussain salam in Karbala. When people asked him that, why are you going to Karbala? He said, I'm going for this. To bid good and for Amr al Maruf and Nahiyan al Munkar. Next, please. Islamic ethical principles are al Takrim, wal Bir, wal Adil, wal Ahsan. And I'll define that in a minute and translate into the Western thoughts. Next, please. This is the Western thought which is put forward by two professors from America. Childress and Butum in 1995. Islam gave the mandate 1400 years ago. Children and uh, Childress and Butum are famous ethicists. They said autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. These are the pillars of modern day medical ethics. And this is what we follow. <coughs> Excuse me. Autonomy means human dignity, honor. And the spine of autonomy is informed consent. You must do everything with fully informed consent. Now, that informed consent sometimes is not applicable to all the societies universally, and that is where I believe, as a very humble student of ethics, that universal principles of ethics are true, but there should be moral relativism also. You may have to modify certain things. Like in India and Pakistan, surrogate consent is still allowed, because if there is a head of the family, we believe that he will take the best uh, decision in our faith, in our, uh, in our interest, and that is called surrogate but I'm not going to the details, it becomes too much medical. Beneficence, bear means that you will serve the mankind, thank you, sir. You will serve the mankind professionally and honestly. And non beneficence you will not bring harm to the patient. Justice is other, and one of the attributes, according to Shia faith, is of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is al adil Next, please. And this is what is the most important thing. Imam Jafar Sadiq al-Islam and Imam Ali al everybody has said that justice is the most important break. It's almost like that string in the tasbih, like the rosary bead runs on a string. If you break that string, the bead will fall apart. Justice maintains the break between autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and everything. Justice is the most important thing. Next, please. This is a quote from Quran. Can you go back? Al -az, this one. In the law, Yamra bil Adl wal Ahsan, this is from Al Nahar, and Hadith in Abbi, one act of justice better than a thousand ibadah, so much importance. Last year, I had the great honor and the privilege of talking of justice, the importance of justice, 
in Essex, in the city of the greatest jurist of all times, Imam Ali al -Islam. What an honor it was. In Kufa and Najaf. I spoke about justice as a pillar. It was such an honor. Next please. Justice is not the other is not the same as Hassan as Hassan. Adil is what is expected of everybody today. And justice does not mean equity. Justice may sometimes bring harm to you. That is why Allah says whenever we pray for his pray for the blessings, we don't ask for justice. We pray for his blessings. Justice may you may be deprived of everything. You don't deserve justice. Because of so many sins we have committed. Ahsan is a several steps higher than uh, than Adil. Ahsan is a combination of altruism, self-denial, and sacrifice. And Maulana Akhil Ghalbi gave a lecture, which I just happened to hear on television, and I liked it so much. He said the best example is, Adil was that Ali was doing, Adil or Prophet was doing, Ali or everybody was doing. But Ahsan is when Ahl Abayat gave away their food for three consecutive days and fasted. And Allah liked it so much that, if, that the family of Panjshan Park was rewarded with ayah, um, correct me if I'm wrong, sir. It's Surah Taha or Dahar. Surah Dahar. And Fadl, Fadl is the ultimate, ultimate attribute, and that is only attributable to, attributable to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Man does not, is not capable of talking about Fadl. This is Ali's mandate on justice. It demands just uh, performance of knowledge, understanding, and clarity of mind. Next, please. I think we'll go to the topic soon. Justice of two types: distributive and retributive. Distributive, we all know that fakery, etc. Retributive is a problem. Quran says very clearly that there should be eye for an eye. Qasas and dia. You know about that because some people do, some don't. Okay. The point is that when people have done the callous of Islam, the people who are doing it today, they are bringing bad name. In the name of retributive justice, they are killing people. That is not allowed. If somebody has committed a mistake or sin, he should be punished equal to his crime. Not overbearing, not overbearing. And this has to be condemned. And this was condemned by Imam Ali al-Islam in many khutbahs that you might have read in Najib al -Abba. Next, please. This is the principle, just a little move on. We'll come to the topics now. Okay, now research has been the basic thing which has been suffering at the hands of people who matter in medical, uh, medical fields. Next. We know about the Nazi training, what happened during the Nazi era, human experimentation was carried out, then the Nuremberg Code came over, and then Helsinki Code in 1964, and the last one is 2008, which tells us how to conduct research on human beings. Next, please. I'll just go through it quickly. Now, bad examples of human experimentation. How medicine is being abused by people who matter. This is one good example to quote. The Tuskegee trial of Birmingham, Alabama, USA, where authorities, I will not name them, I cannot, cannot name them, but government authorities in USA, for 30 years used black African Americans who were infected with syphilis, divide them into controls and the patients after penicillin was discovered and deprive them of treatment. Deliberately, to, sell the, to see the tertiary effects of syphilis. This went on in 19, started in 1932, went on till 1972, when a whistle blew, blew up the whole thing. In 98, or whenever President Clinton was president, he had to come to apologize to the nation. That this is what they did in modern times. You cannot deprive a human being because it's colored, black or brown, whatever, of the known treatment. That is ultimate injustice, which was done. Next, please. Go through rapidly. Johns Hopkins, no, the other one. Johns Hopkins story of blue babies, I recently came across, my son is a cardiologist in America, he showed me this documentary, because he's an adult congenital cardiology. Amazing story, it's of modern times. Johns Hopkins, the famous medical university that you must have heard of. There was a surgeon who was trying to treat blue babies, children who were born with a normal pulmonary circulation. <coughs> Excuse me. He found a formula, but he did not know how to do it. So he hired a technician, a lab technician, who happened to be an African-American. That technician developed the technique and did experimental work on dogs and showed that primary circulation could be bypassed so that the blue blood would not mix with the red blood. The surgeon went and operated and got stuck in the middle of the theater. 
Johns Hopkins in 1964, I'm told. The man was not allowed to come from the trenches from the bottom, somewhere in the pit where we were sitting doing experiment, because it was against the norm of Johns Hopkins that a black man should come into the corridor. Anyway, to cut the story short, the man came head with the surgery, with, with the surgery, and he became known to people that there is a black man who's doing this work. But that black man was not allowed to enter the premises. He disappeared, went into a wilderness, and retired somewhere. Twenty years later, when this professor, famous whose portrait is now hanging in Charles Hopkins, somehow his conscience bit him. So he went looking for that African American who had actually guided him found himself in the wilderness, brought him over, and then they gave him the honorary doctorate and his photo is now hanging in Charles Hopkins. This happened in recently, in 1978, they had to put this. Next, please. First ever heart transplant in South Africa, in Group Shore Hospital by Professor Christian Bernard, that I'm sure you must, at least I remember it, because I was a student those days, in London, that was performed without informed consent, without tissue matching. Because tissue matching came when I was a student of in the Royal College of Surgeons in London, in primary, primary forces, 1968. This was done in 66. So they did tissue matching. No tissue matching, this is a heart transplant. Next, please. Lots of examples. Phase four clinical trials, which are being AZT is a famous drug used for HIV treatment. It was proved to be effective in France and Germany and America that it could control the vertical transmission from infected mothers to the children by at least 25% or even more. They withdrew that drug, the manufacturers, and experimented in Africa and Thailand and used placebo, despite the proven efficiency of the drug, in the infected people. Not just that, they made them unaffordable. And one of the doctors from Karachi, Farad Mazam, she wrote a wonderful article, went to the UN and got it finally approved. Now it's accepted. Okay, now we come to the modern problems. Managed healthcare. This is an American thing that's come to the UK. When I was studying, I was doing NHS service 30 years ago, when NHS was also young, these things did not happen. Now it has happened that everything is controlled. People control the destiny of the patient and physicians. Whatever is happening, doctors are in practice, they know that you, are, you can do so much and not that much. Now, distribution of services within limited resources is, has become a major issue. How do you deprive a patient of a scan when it is needed? Sometimes you have to because you have to cut down the cost. This is a problem that these people who are called the gatekeepers are creating a, a havoc with professionals everywhere. Therapeutic nihilism. A patient has become a terminal, terminal case. Islam has given a clear mandate that life and death both are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you decide that you should stop the treatment now? And what are the parameters which determine when the treatment should be stopped. There's a lot of material on it. I can't go into the details, unfortunately. Some people decide towards the end that the treatment is futile, so we should stop it. And they're going to pay palliative care part. Very controversial. There's a question of human dignity and what's called the quality adjusted life years. That if X amount of money is used for this patient, he may live longer and be productive to society. To the society. Therefore, we should put the money for his care rather than the other person who will not be so good to society. And there's a big formula for it. I've got a formula if somebody's interested, I'd be happy to do. Then there's a question of living will, which is all the thing. Islam, has, Shia faith in particular, has a clear mandate that we must write a will. When we go for Hajj, we must write a will. Will determines what are parameters, whether or not to be resuscitated, what to give the organ donation, etc. Some people don't like it. They say that living will is not love for whatever reason. I don't agree with that. That's my view. Next, please. Next, please. This I just mentioned. DNR orders, you mentioned about it. Somebody is dying of illness. How do you determine? Uh, Qasim is not here. He's a strong believer. He's an uh, organ transplant man in Ireland. He is a strong believer that DNR farm should not be signed by us. But well, that's very difficult. There is a law which says that you have a patient comes in a terminal case, doctors have to fill up the form DNR or DNAR. From my point of view, it's a different thing whether I want to be resuscitated or not. From the patient's point of view, we as physicians working in the NHS are obliged to fill it. Now that is a question of debate that we can discuss later on if you want. 
whether she are fit allows it or not. Then there is the question of discrete passive euthanasia. Euthanasia, Islam abhors, does not allow it at all. But like I said, it's a multicultural, multi faith society, so we have to take care of all kinds of patients. Then there is the palliative care, an advanced directive which is coming up that I may be allowed to go to Dignitas or wherever to die, that kind of thing. These are controversial issues. These are the grey zones where debate is needed, nothing definite has come out. Next please. Then there are patients who are gone into coma. How would you decide whether the patient should go on a ventilator or not? Should you consider the family resources? particularly in developing countries like India, Pakistan, and others, where you have to bear the cost of treatment, which could be many years. Like here also, for example, sometimes because the services are limited, ventilators, the use, and the complications that go with it, and what happens after that when the patient recovers, the long-term disability issues, all this, those factors have to be kept in view. Then, assisted death issues. Some people believe that and I think probably there is some justification that, that in certain situations, death is uh, a blessing, in certain situations. And therefore they say that assistant, assisting the dying process may be allowed. Islam does not allow it. Shia faith does not allow it, absolutely. But as physician, what do you do if you're working in this country? Then this very controversial concept of brain death versus traumatic death, because organ transplant is a current thing which is going on, Definition of brain death is very clear. Iran has done amazing work in this field, from our point, from Islamic point of view. They have given clear mandate that brain death, somatic death is biological death, when the tissues stop working. Brain death has to be determined by a team, it's called ethics committee, which will have doctors, neurologists, anesthesiologists, uh, a religious scholar, and alim al who should determine after a certain trial, and that's a formula, 100% oxygen, then you deventilate the patient, let him breathe naturally, then you have 6% oxygen, let him breathe for a while, and you do it three times and record the EEG and monitor the clinical signs. When the brain is dead, then you call it brain death. Now, that is where the question comes. Delaying death for organ harvesting. How long can you delay the dying process? No religion allows delaying the death process. The death is an inevitable, ultimate, kullan of sinzat of Everybody has to die. How much can you delay to harvest the organ? There are people who argue that, but I think there are people who believe strongly that if organs can be used for other people's benefits, death can be delayed for an X number of hours or times. And I think there is a justification there. But that organ which is going to get wasted, wasted away, if it can save the life, that certainly is beneficial to mankind. Next. This is another problem. Yes, organ donation is a common thing. Organ theft in India and Pakistan is a big problem. And they're trading the organs. In Iran, they have recently not promulgated, but are discussing at the moment, to introduce, to introduce a certain fee for that organ. More like a token, like a gift, that you're giving me help, so I'm giving you this money. And that has not been proved yet, that whether they've done it or not. But that's one thing that's come. Presumed concept, presumed consent is being discussed in the UK, that you will all be listed for organ donation unless you presume, unless you opt out. And this is a discussion that was going on last year. I'm sure Jeff from the Council of the Parliament will know. Next. Finally, just two things, stem cell and surrogacy. Stem cell research is an amazing thing that's happening. And I have a technician in my hospital where I work. He's recently he was diagnosed with a tumor, and the stem cell therapy has improved tremendously. I can see the difference in myself in the last two years. Right, next please. Now, what is stem cell? This is all a bit of embryology. I'll just go through it rapidly. These are totally, they've always been, when I was a student, our professor Wahid used to call them pluri, pluripotent, <coughs> totipotent cells. Now they've defined them into different categories, but they're cells which have the inherent capacity to transform into any kind of cell tissue or organ. And these cells are present only between fifth and the 14th day of intrauterine embryonic life. Then they mature and their potency increases, uh, decreases. Next, please. Okay. Now, these, this is what is the function of the uh, stem cell. It can cure anything from diabetes to cardiac condition to deaf people to whatever. Everything, even paraplegies, may be cured, and this is the future. Next, please. Two lines were established, germ lines, which, compare, which consist of gametes, and therefore you cannot interfere them. Once they were discovered, I think in nine or ten lines, they will stop. Nobody is allowed to handle or touch them. 
Semantic lines are being developed constantly for development of organs like skin and other tissues, heart and muscles and everything. Next, please. The sources of stem cells are embryos, umbilical cord blood, and now they are also using adult skins and bone marrow. Next. This is the question. Embryos, should they be allowed to be, to use, to be used for harvesting stem cells or not? Are embryos alive? And when does their life begin? This is a time-honored question, and you will see in a minute. Next, please. In Quran, these three surahs are very specific about embryology. Al-Hajj, Al-Mu'minun, Al and Al-Zumr. I'll mention two of them, please. Next, please. In embryology, in Al-Hajj comes exactly in those categories. From Nutfa to Alaqa to Mughra to Gherb. And this has been translated by the professor that I was talking, Professor Fida It was a professor of anatomy passed away. Next, please. Now mind the translation. People have given different translations because they were non-technical translations. What does it mean in terms of embryology? Next, please. Next. This is the embryologist's explanation that nutfa fertilization is zygote formation, morula is alaqa, blastula with pluritissence is mujga, and embryo formation is mukhlaqa wa ghaira mukhlaqa. Four categories in embryology in that order in al-Hajj and al mumnu Exactly in that order. In al-Zumr, Quran said that we created you in, the, in, uh, in your mother's wombs in three layers of darkness, which could be abdomen, uterus, and amniotic sac. And I interpret it as three general layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, because that is how you develop ultimately into human beings. And roof, we don't know where roof enters. And Quran says, but in Israel is very sick, you're a prophet, and when they ask you about roof, says, Amr Rabbi, we don't know where it enters. But it's different um, hadiths which are available, 40 days, 120 days, etc. Next, please. This is the scientific view, that in the third week of embryonic life, the primitive streak develops, which is a pre precursor of the nervous system. After that, the embryo cannot divide into two. And therefore, that is the beginning of life. According to Larajani, he is a name that you must read. If you, want, if you are interested in Islamic ethics, read his work. Larajani is an Iranian professor. Superb work is done. Next, please. The different countries have different formulae. For example, here in the USA, they disallow the use of extra embryos developed through IVF and things for any kind of research of stem cells. In the UK, they allow it, but disallow the use of stem cells, uh, embryos for implantation for intrauterine use. This needs further debate and further clarification. I'm not clear about it. Next, please. This was the view of the Islamic World Council in Mecca, and uh, you can read it in 2003. They allowed it. Provided the source is right, that is the adult placenta, or adult segment from placenta, umbilical cord, and excess fertilized eggs through IVF. Next, please. Iran has gone far ahead because they have the support of the ulama and they are marajay taplid, the very learned people. They said stem cells and animal cloning, not this should be a word here, animal cloning for therapeutic purposes, etc., is allowed. But uh, they're still debating it. Iran has definitely encouraged stem cell research as a far ahead. Next, please. And this is the question Should we allow the, uh, the IVF to generate embryos for extra, for, uh, for harvesting stem cells and things or not? Or should they be allowed to? Uh, uh, to perish in petri dish. Next, please. This is the Iran's work, virtue. Uh, the, uh, this gentleman called Mansour Sunai is a PhD in it, and he published it recently. Next, please. Finally, surrogacy. And you mentioned in your uh, introduction that some people have no children. Now, that could be a big problem in patriarchal societies of India and Pakistan, where everybody wants their son or a daughter, at least for the landed property or whatever. Now, there are different ways of dealing with it. Of course, uh, adoption is one way, and Islam encourages adoption. Adopt a yatim, it's a great benefit. I mean, Prophet did uh, in the form of Zayd, and Ali did in the form of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. But the adopted son or child will not have the same legal rights, not even the name. The name has to be of the original father. 
Therefore, this concept of surrogacy has come up in recent, it's of course applicable to all nationalities and things, but I'm just talking about Islamic viewpoint and particularly with, uh, with reference to um, Shia faith. Okay, there are different fatwas available. Next, please. Sunni Islam categorically uh, denies surrogacy, it does not allow, total ban, not allowed at all. But some Shia Maharaji, and I'm very careful in saying it, some only, allowed it. Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has allowed it. Ayatollah al sistani Sayyid Hakim al Tabatabai, and I think Bashir Najafi do not allow it. So one has to be careful. This means third party gamete transfer. That means, and there is a word they use in Iran called Sira, which is muta, which is a temporary contract marriage, and that does not involve physical contact. I don't want to go into the details of the presence of ladies and children, but uh, there is a lot of material available on it. Should it be allowed or not? My humble opinion is that it has to be very carefully considered and thought. At the moment, there is debate going on, and Ayatollah Sistani, whom we follow, we are waiting to hear from him. And there is a gentleman who recently wrote to me from Australia. Uh, he is uh, into ethics that he has got in touch with Ayatollah Sistani to get a clear mandate that whether it should be allowed or not. So surrogacy is a very hot, controversial subject. <coughs> Men can be married. That's good. It's possible in Islam the four marriages are allowed, but what should a woman do? Because she wants a biological child, and that is where the concept of muta comes in. That according to this formula, a married woman can have a divorce, follow iddat for three and a half months, then get the sperm from a third, I mean third person without physical contact through the IVF, get transferred, and that gamete could give a biological child. It's a very, very complex issue, and these are the ethical slippery slopes where one has to tread very carefully. Okay? And this is the uh, thing that if a man wants to uh, do a sila, it should be a divorcee or a widow with her own children. It's a very complex issue, and this is where the Sharia comes in, and I'm no authority, I have no idea. I need to learn from uh, people who matter. And Rasa Puna Phil Il, next please. This was a mandate by, given by uh, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, and what happened after that uh, fatwa? There are a lot of Arab women from Egypt and from other countries, even Saudi Arabia, went to Lebanon, where these special clinics were established under the mandate of Ayatollah Khamenei, and pretending to be Shia, they had the biological children to Syria and came over. And therefore, Ayatollah Khamenei was uh, approached, and I think. Probably, as I understand, he's revising or reviewing, his advisors must be advising on that. Next, please. This is all very complex, so don't go into it. Next, please. This is the same thing that I mentioned. Next. These are different steps of Sira and common. Now, this is what some people are doing in Iran, and I'm sure in Lebanon as well. That you can have none. Now, the problem. This is where the Time Magazine published an article a friend of mine gave to me, and I was really uh, amazed at what America is doing. America is exporting huge bulk of sperm law to different countries, to European countries, not to the Muslim countries, thank God for that. And they are doing, uh, as that article is worth reading at the court here, Time Magazine, volume so and so, 2000, you should read that. There's so much that's going on. Now that is creating a problem for Israel. Because there's a question of possibility of incest. And that is a major issue. So what the Jewish, Jewish advisor said that if the sperm donation has to be done, it should be a known donor, not an anonymous donor. And, that, and they're encouraging non Jewish This is a big issue. It's a very big issue at the moment in ethical circles, which is going on at the moment. But just to tell you that uh, one of the things that's happening Finally, what should a physician do? He should observe the code of ethics in terms of autonomy, human dignity, and rights of a person. Khud Mukhtari is the word for it. Serve to the best and efficient way in order to uh, do good to the patient and uh, act according to the just, uh, principle of justice. Think that should be there. This is where I'd like to end, maybe just one triangle. There is this battle of Khair or Shur, good and evil going on from Azal Setar, Khair or Shur, yeah, there, of course. Azal say, Satiza Khair Raha hai, Azal Setar rose. 
सतीजा कार रहा है अजल से ताय रोज चरारे मुस्तफावी से चरारे बुरा भी दिस इज दैट द कांस्टेंट बैटल बिटवीन गुड एंड इवल हैज बीन गोइंग ऑन फ्रॉम डे वन रिफॉर्मर्स ट्राई टू रिफॉर्म एंड देयर बीन सोक्रेटिस एंड स्टॉटल एंड प्लेटो ऑफ कोर्स प्रोफेसर मोहम्मद एंड अदर प्रोफेसर ऑफ कोर्स एंड देन अल्टीमेटली अली अल इस्लाम हुसैन रिएक्शनरीज ऑलवेज अपोज देम ऑन द फेस ऑफ इट the reactionaries to win the battle yazid in his time whatever or whoever it was but nobody remembers them does anyone remember the name of the judge who condemned socrates to drinking the bowl of hamlet nobody but everybody remembers socrates so reformers leave the indelible impression of their footmarks on the sands of time and the reactionaries disappear and that is what we would like to do reformers in our way finally I think there was one before that. It's called triangle of ethics. Can you go just one more? There's not. Anyway, I'll tell you. There is a triangle of ethics, and I just it just came to mind when you talk about the telephone and other things. That it is not. See the three things. Knowledge is power. Skills come when you apply the knowledge. It gives a practical form. Whether you use that knowledge and skill for the benefit of mankind or for the evil purpose is all dependent on your conscience. the conscience is a non tangible entity you cannot see it madam curry discovered radiation for the treatment of cancer somebody else chap called openheimer exploded a bomb and that is where the importance of conscience comes in and islam is basically a religion of conscience and that is the crux of the matter it is the constant touch between you and your god whatever you do to the world or to your self wilderness or in company or multitude or solitude whatever it is your conscience that determines whether you're doing a good act or a bad whether you use that knife for cutting an apple or somebody's throat that is your conscience that determines it the conscience is you cannot see what in my it's called batin the tangible form of conscience is justice so if your act is just and you're doing in uh, uh, to promote justice then you are doing an ethical act and that is a parameter you can use anywhere in the world in any society if your act is just it is ethical if it is unjust it has to be evil it must be condemned and this is the last from surah yasin wa ma alayna illa al balagh wa balagh al gulli thank you so much allah So I think we all have to thank Professor Shabir Dazeri from Depths of Heart for taking the time to come here, but also deliver this excellent lecture. Um, there were a lot of profound issues discussed over here, and I'm sure you'll all be having a lot of questions to ask. So I think it's important for us first to have a bit of a breather. Could you all please stand up in one place? <laughs> and I'd also like to sort of, you know, um, mention that we have the privilege to have amongst us the coordinator of. Imam Medics UK uh, Dr Wasih Haider could he please make himself known uh, put your hand up please Dr Wasih Haider so he's here and Dr Wasih Haider will actually uh, give his contact details to the Edinburgh Edinburgh Society so if anybody wishes to volunteer in whatever form shape you know uh, in person or in kind then Imam Medics International will certainly welcome that help now i've got to say that we will have questions from the floor but equally if you've got volunteers going around with slips of paper and if anybody has questions then they can write down those questions and we will answer them in confidentiality uh so we'll do that now i have to say that professor zedi took stuck to time 45 minutes and we'll try and stick to time as well we've got between half an hour and 45 minutes because we've also got to vacate the hall at a certain time we might get into your refreshment break and a bit of networking but i'm certain that you know it'll be worth it thank you so we'll start off uh with yeah please sit down <laughs> so um we'll start off with a question from me i'll start you know i mean we'll start at the very beginning of life uh, professor said you mentioned about embryos um about multiple embryos that are created for 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 those who might want to know the process of assisted conception or you know ivf you have to create multiple embryos you decide on one child and then what happens to the rest of the embryos there's that issue 
but also there's the other issue of selective uh, sex, where there, are, there is uh, a debate about whether somebody can choose to have a male or a female child. I mean, it is possible <coughs> these days through IVF. So is there uh, the two questions in this? One is, I mean, what's the Islamic position on uh, selecting sex or the sex of the child, but also um, what is the position about destroying the embryos and for how long we, they can be kept? Well, as far as eugenics is concerned, it's totally not allowed. It's disallowed, totally banned. And a lot of people have written, I wrote it in my first book, which I published in 1995, that eugenics, where you select race, color, creed, etc., is not allowed. Islam abhors it. You cannot interfere with divine destiny process. That's simple. And I think all Fuqa agree with it. Uh, regarding uh, spare embryos, I did mention here that this is the question which is being debated in some circles, that if during the IVF process you have created extra embryos, should you allow? Islam has different views. Sunni Fuqa is very clear, and now Shia Fuqa is also clear, that extra embryos should not be created. And the new mandate that came from Iran recently is that IVF, IVF cycle, you only use that embryo and they allow, allow the others to perish naturally. That's it. Excellent. And I think the other thing is, can I just add, the stem cell research has advanced further ahead, and now they're not using embryos anymore. They're starting new technologies of picking up cells from skin and other tissues. And it doesn't have the same totally potent character, like bone marrow, for example, can be used for regeneration of multiple myelomas and things. But at least you're not using it. That debate, I think, probably we all by the time we are next session. So essentially you're saying that you don't have to clone a human to be able to provide stem cells? Human cloning was discussed, and once I wrote a stupid article, on which I repeat very much, uh, where I said that human cloning went after the famous experiment in Edinburgh by the sheep, Dolly, etc. I wrote, and I gave an example, which probably is not right, about Jesus Christ and Mary. They were born asexually, and I was confused there, so I approached other people. I regret to be, I did not get the answer, but that's not the situation. Cloning, human cloning is not allowed anymore. No fiqh no religion right, Thank you very much. So, questions to the floor now. Um, Uh, thank you very much. That was a brilliant speech. Uh, I have a few questions in organ donation. I understand, you know, you talked about the brain and about, you know, coming to, you know, a decision between several people to reach a decision. But in certain instances where a person may be perhaps in a coma and organ donation, you know, like we know that, you know, sometimes we need to remove organs. Um, as a chief, are we allowed to donate and where do we lie in donations because it's a very, um, it, we, don't, we don't know. We really I'll don't give know. you a very simple answer. This question was put to Iran for many, many years ago. Uh, this was I think during the first Iran-Iraq war and the question was raised that should blood donation be allowed? And somebody die hard or I'm asked him. Ayatollah Khomeini was one man I think we should all praise, irrespective of your base. He gave us two things. The concept of Walayat al faqih that means, and this is an old thought, again from Aristotle, that a leader should also be a learned scholar. And the second thing he said was, the uh, second thing that he gave was, that administration should be just. That is what Ayatollah Khomeini did. So when he was asked this question, he said that, look, I'll consult my advisors. So he went into this meeting with medical advisors and came up with a mandate and that's called istafa. I think the word is istafa. That if something can benefit the mankind, you should allow it. So blood donation was allowed and blood is the most vital organ of the body. And hence the kidney donation in Iran, they're doing everything. The question that crops up, and this was a question that when I was doing a debate on Hidayat TV, I was asked and I couldn't answer that, but I have my own views on that that yes, you can give a donation to a non-Muslim, as a Muslim, but can you take one from the non-Muslim or not? Because that kidney or liver, particularly liver, may have consumed a lot of alcohol. Now, I have my views on it. 
and I'm only a humble student of ethics, my feeling is that if you can take blood from anybody, why can't you do the, kid do the kidney and liver? Simple as that. But some of them I don't agree with it. I must warn you that. Right, we've got uh, a question from the very front of the floor and uh, no other than Mr. Shabar Jaffi. Thank you, Dr. Uh, first of much of a, a very enlightening uh, lecture on subject. Learned uh, a lot of things. With our philosophy that saving one life based on that tenet, saving one life is to you've seen save the whole of mankind. And one of the positive attributes of Shia Islam is its openness. And because of what I mentioned earlier on, it's, it's, yeah, it's common logic, common sense. And what you just said about Ayatollah Khomeini is you know, an example of that simplicity. In your presentation, which is very good, the, the concept of uh, surrogacy, you mentioned we are married or temporary marriage. Would you mind perhaps, Professor Syed, elaborating on that further? Because there's an issue here that, from my colleagues here in the council as well, in the country generally, there are a lot of Muslim children, and you alluded to this, that we should be looking to, uh, you know, take orphans, uh, adopt, them. adopt uh, children, especially orphans, caught in the can. But there are a lot of children in the UK who are neglected, Muslim children in particular, who have been raised as Muslims and in their infancy, they're put away to other places. So as a comparison between surrogacy and perhaps if it's allowed we a muta or siga or a, a permanent marriage and your thoughts on how we as Muslims, particularly Shia Muslims, right. should have big hands to go for adoption. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. So, right, as far as adoption is concerned, that is the best thing to do because that is generous, that is kindness, humanity, above all religions and faiths. I mean, the Quran is full of mandates about care of the yatim and faqir and, uh, and people who are need, etc. And Prophet showed it himself. He adopted and Imam Ali adopted. The two examples, I'm sure, other I might as well. Adoption is the best. But there are some people, and I have a friend. Me, in Karachi, a very learned man, uh, they didn't have a child. And I mentioned they had gone to abortion things. Some years ago, 25 years ago, I told them that you should adopt, adopt your nephew. They didn't like it. <coughs> there are people who want a biological child, whether it's for grief or for some other reason, for keeping the dynasty alive, whatever, whatever. It's very difficult to say, but there are people who do that. Therefore, if adoption is not acceptable, then there is this option in Shia Islam. And let me tell you, Muta was allowed until the second caliph. When he, lots of other things, he stopped, he stopped this one. There was a reason for Muta. And this happened again in Iran, when after the first, uh, after the Iran-Iraq war, um, President Rafsanjani, he gave this mandate. He said because there are lots of women who are divorced, or not divorced, widows, and they're young. They can't live. I mean, in UK, you've got the state country, you've got the funds and everything, and disability, just whatever you can get. But in other countries like Iran, where there's no source of income, what should a woman do? She has no support. So Islam gave the permission that you can have another nikah. So four women are allowed. But when it comes to muta, there was a controversy. And that controversy was basically based on the fact that yes, sometimes can lead to problems, but muta is allowed in Iran. It is called siga in Farsi and muta in Arabic, which means it's a contract marriage for a specified period of time for a certain dowry, and then it, um, it finishes off. It's given clearly in, in Quran also, in the Hadith. Here, Ayatollah Khamenei went one step ahead. He said, if you want a biological child without the physical contact, then you can have the contract marriage behind the parda, behind the screen, with a certain uh, woman who is a widow or a divorcee with all children, without physical contact, have the egg donated, use it the sperm as IVF technology into your own personal wife, and you can have a biological child. So there is no physical contact involved. Excellent. Yeah. What is that? I just wanted some clarification um, regarding donation. Um, regarding? 
regarding donation, organ um, donation. Organ donation sorry, um, I think uh, one of our sisters there was mentioning. But um, what I wanted to ask for clarification on was that my understanding was that um, if you pass away, you're not allowed to donate your organs. Well, that's why living will is essential. Sorry. Living will or advanced directive. Yeah, but what's the <coughs> view on that? I've heard that some people have said that um, if you have passed away, it's not your body; it's God's has given it to you. You can't. This has it. been mandated. This has been discussed a thousand times before. You see, if you can save one life, like you just said, your organ, if it can benefit another person, then it's. Ayatollah Khomeini has written a, In fact, Ayatollah Khomeini's father had written something about it some 40 years ago when they were talking about the first Shah of Iran. And there's a famous book, I can't quote you the name, I can't remember the name. But this debate has been going on that can you benefit the mankind in some way or the other. The organ donation came up much later. Ayatollah Khomeini has written a full chapter in his book by the name Istafa. That means if you can benefit somebody, you should do it. And in order to do that, if you have the living will, if you mandate in your will that my organs can be donated, fine. If, then, if you're not left a, uh, left a will, then it becomes a different issue. And that is where, in the state of Oregon and many other states in America, you have, your kidney or liver does not belong to you after death. In the UK, last year there was a debate going on that one should have presumed consent that unless you've opted out, your organs can be used. So I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if they've reached the conclusion there, but not, not yet, no. Linking on to Zamin's question, um, I just want to sort of you know, continue on the theme of organ donation. We've had, we've had three questions. Now, one question that has often actually provoked a bit of thought in my own head is what sort of tissue can we accept? Because we talk about valve treatments, you know, heart valve transplants that use pig tissue or bovine mm. tissue, cow tissue. So the question here was what animal organs could be, could be used, but you know, it is commonplace using animal tissue. So, I mean, where does Islam stand with pig no, tissue? I think instance? that is very clear. It, has, it is haram. But Dr. Uh, Marana Sayyid Musfi, who was a very learned Iraqi scholar, and he was my guide in my first Hajj. Once I was debating with him, I was sitting in Medina. Uh, we were just having debates. This very learned man, he comes on television channel also, CN Musi, he speaks several languages. He said something uh, that if you're not aware of it, that it is what the source is, then you may use it. But I think caution is always the best thing. Like for example, these baby jellies and things, sometimes even they have uh, different kinds of gelatin. My grandson was six year old or seven year old last year, was visiting, I gave him a gel. He said, he asked his mother, is it halal? I said, I don't know, we will not take it. So if you know that it's haram, then obviously you can't use it. But there has been shown to be a certain benefit where you yes. use uh, artificial valves yes. or tissue yes. from heart where the patient does not need prolonged treatment with blood thinners. Mm -hmm. So is there, I mean, a certain position on that? Is there, a, 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 if you like, you know, an exclusion clause for the want of a better word? Like I said, Sayyid Musi told me that if you're not aware of it, you can use it, but I think further debate in this. There are lots of issues that need to be debated. They're great zones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, on the same topic again, talking about animals, there's been a question mm -hmm. from the floor asking about the ingestion of gelatin and alcohol within medicines. So, um, same applies to alcohol that we use for scrubbing. I mean, can you use it? We do all the time. Mm -hmm. Right, excellent. So, um, we've got a question from Mr. Zishan Sheikh, who's a plastic surgeon. Oh. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. Um, thank you very much for your talk. I was just contemplating what you mentioned. Knowledge is, in, is useless without skills. <coughs> uh, and um, yeah, in order to go further forward, you need to augment your knowledge by doing yeah. research. Uh, genetic modification is something that's a big topic. Genetic modification of crops is quite yes. vital yes. nowadays. People have been talking about genetic modification of human beings, and underground people have been probably uh, modifying uh, or joining animal gen genes with human genes. It's got cybered. Yes, it's exactly. And as you've mentioned, in order for us to move forward, we need to do certain things and if we didn't do that, we wouldn't know where the future would lie. But rightly so, it's not correct to, to do this genetic kind of modification as you're talking. So how then do you think we can progress if we're not allowed to do these things? 
You see, human cloning has been debated for a long time, and people have attempted to do it. The fear is that one day you might end up with a Frankenstein. And that is why, if the science is not at that, I mean science, I'm talking generally, not Islamic point of view. Science is not that advanced that you can curtail that evil person, Dr. Frankenstein, creating yet another evil. Probably there has to be caution. But yes, perhaps what can happen, and that is where I feel there's a strong possibility, eugenics may be used for growing kidney or liver or heart separately. And they're using it, I think they're, they're already doing it. I mean, the famous example of that mouse with, a, with an ear at the back, you know, the famous thing. And that is where, probably organs will be uh, harvested and they'll be left. I'm sure the labs are already... In Korea, there was a report only recently that a human clone has been developed, which is condemned by uh, Dr. Bakr Larijani, that no, that should not be allowed. No religion should... You see, ethics without religion is fair. What is the role of religion? It's almost like saying that you know where to cross the road, or how to cross the road, but you don't know where to cross it. That is where the religion works like a zebra crossing. <laughs> right, from a plastic surgeon, we move on to a couple of plastic surgical questions. Um, somebody has asked um, a question about breast implants and cosmetic surgery. Um, is there any sort of, you know, Islamic thinking on this issue? Reconstructive surgery has been going on for years. Islam does not disallow it. I mean, Allah is khubsurat. He likes everything Haseen. Yeah, and he's created man into his own image. That is what the Bible said. That's what the Quran said. So how would he like somebody to be ugly? No, I don't agree with that. Reconstructive surgery is not possible. But Simple. if you it's all logic, I mean, it's all, that's what he said. Logic and his jihad go together. But if you stretch that concept, say, into something as prior to say, breast implants, I mean, where does that fit? See, for cosmetic reasons, see, there's a limit to everything. In Australia, we had a debate once, and I was invited to a debate where this kind of question came up. And the debate, and there were four people, a rabbi, uh, a padre, a learned Christian scholar, an atheist, a Hindu scholar, and me, the most ignorant. And we were given this task that if there's an X amount of money and a rich man comes for plastic surgery of his nose, and you're the gatekeeper, and there's a woman who comes with an orphan, baby or, or not an orphan, a child without a father, who needs a uh, cochlear implant, what would you advise? Same kind of thing, reconstructive. Well, my, sim my answer was simple, knowledge, the triangle of ethics that I said earlier on. Uh, if you're doing reform, then cochlear implants definitely will be worthy. I mean, reconstructive surgery, man can go to hell. We're not interested in that. We'd rather give a healthy, useful child to society. And that is the role of qualities and dollies also, that if we can produce a human being, which, I mean, the man is reconstructed. Same applies to augmentation of breast transplants. I mean, that, that really, Islam doesn't probably will not even consider that. But again, it's Fuqa who might be able to tell that. We had another question about somebody who uh, was considering having reconstructive surgery. Uh, for obesity and uh, about improving their marriage prospects. So, I mean, would that, would the same principle apply there? I think again, the same thing. Like I said, God has created man into his image. So obviously, if there is an ugly person who wants to be pretty, why not? But coming back to the period, organ transplant, like a breast transplant, yes, I think there is a question that's cropping up my mind also, I put to some of the people, that if a woman has had a mastectomy, can she have an implant? I think she should. She should have. So we have another question uh, from the same person who brought up the issues of reconstructive surgery. Uh, what do you do to an amputated limb? I mean, that's you know, something that... That is depends on your faith. It depends on your faith. If you're a Muslim, it should be valid. Right, so I mean, that's pretty clear. Because at the, on the last day of judgment, each part of your body will be... This is the reason why some people say that you cannot have a donation uh, from a kafir, which is something silly, but this is what it says. Quran is mandated that every organ, every part of your body will be raised from wherever it is and each will be answerable under their judgment. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Uh, really enjoying uh, the discussion today. Um, this is a question regarding medical professionals and, uh, and the assistance that they might be able to have, perhaps from the organization, the mommy organization, etc. For example, if the person, uh, we live in a society, a plural society, if, say, there's a medical profession, somebody approaches him to, say, 
they want this person wants a term, uh, termination of pregnancy. Now that person who is who is the medical professional, it says against his ethics to do that. But we live in a society that is. Yes. That how do we uh, you know resolve that situation? But as a Muslim physician, I will refrain from doing it and pass that patient on to a colleague. Right, I have to say that. I will not compromise my faith on that. I have to say that what Baris did not say was that this question, he's probably answering this question by proxy yeah. because his daughter is a medical student. Oh, so. <laughs> just, if I can just add yeah. to that, if a person is again, the situation where, yeah. uh, you know, if a person is in a coma, he's not in the situation where, that you, where you have to actually perhaps, you know, switch the monitors off. Yes. You know, but it's not just not for that. in that situation. No. You were again being going to be, you know, the deciding factor in that. Yes, for that there is a very clear formula, and there is an ethics committee that every institution must have. If there is no uh, living will, advanced directive, or a mandate given about whatever is to be done. Uh, then the ethics committee decides that. And the ethics committee is a very powerful committee. It comprises of eight or nine members, heads of the institutions, medical doctor who is dealing with it, religious scholar, and lay people. And they then discuss this thing and then they reach a decision. This is a very common practice. Everybody, every institution must have an ethics committee. About IMI that you mentioned, I'd just like to add one thing that uh, uh, you mentioned quite a few things that we're doing. One thing that's very interesting that's cropping up now is that we're establishing a medical school in the Caribbean, inshallah soon. Uh, it is not IMI's project, IMI is supporting it. And that is what I'd like to tell you, that I probably am visiting that place next week to see the campus, and if you like it, that IMI faculty will teach the students there. Your children, those who are here, you want to send to medical schools, well, this may be the place. It will be in a beautiful place called Barbados. <laughs> we have a question here from Salim Madrut. This morning, um, that somebody asked me if it would be possible that the presentation that you gave, the PowerPoint, would it be possible for you to share that with the community? Well, why not? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent. Um, we don't have much time. We literally have a couple of minutes before we round up. Now, somebody has actually asked, given the diversity of um, the views of scholars on so many issues of ethics in Islam, does it make not make sense to speak from a single Islamic perspective on any given point? I think I have the answer for that. Yeah. I mean, I don't think Muslims or any, I mean, human mankind no. themselves are never sort of, you know, uh, have a, they don't have a consensus <laughs> on opinion. That's why you have multiple political parties, multiple views, and I suppose that's why you have conflict in this no, world. I think there is an English dictum which is very useful for such occasions, and that is something like this. Wise men hardly ever agree, and fools seldom disagree. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I also had a question about stem cells for diabetes. I mean, uh, are you aware about the latest advances and where the Islamic perspective? Well, I think that's right. anything that's good for mankind. It's it's not the use of stem cells that is controversial. It's the source of stem cells, and even that is now. I think that debate is almost over. They are starting to use adult stem cells from skin and organs. So I think probably embryonic stem cell period is gone. The trophozytes can stay where they are. It probably will not bother them. One final question. My question is regarding the dead bodies. If somebody died at home or even somewhere, which is uh, their body is taken away into the hospital and they are given post-mortem, uh, I was under the impression that if we are not supposed to get the post-mortem done, we should be buried as it is. What is your ethics in about this? I don't know. This is a Shari masala. It's not an ethical masala. Medically, that is. And this is Shari, shari will be able to. But I think if you're living in a, if there is a condition, a situation where there's doubt about this, the nature of death, and you see the fundamental rule is that you must abide the, by the law of the land in which you're living. Simple as that. And I think that's where the uh, other faiths and other sects in Islam are different to Shia faith. Shia faith is basically very simple, very orderly, that we follow the teachings of Muhammad or Muhammad, even in the worst of enemies, with the worst of enemies of Islam, like Al-Mutawakkil, 
would destroy the Qabr of Hussain three times, not once. Imam lived with them. I mean, like Mamun Rashid was such a cruel person. Harun Rashid was even worse. Imam Raza Islam lived with them. I think, and they did not violate the rules. So I think the, it's not a question of Imam Ali Islam, such a brave man. He was dragged in the streets of Medina with a rope around his neck. Could he not stand up and fight? He could. But that is where sabr and taqwa comes out. He had to follow the law of the land. Right. Um, final point again. Uh, I've been asked if Imam Medics International can be contacted on a professional level for advice. But could I also ask you I mean, whether there are open portals for the likes of Ayatollah Sistani, and uh, I'm aware that he does have a website, but are these portals open for people to approach for any ethical issues that they may be facing? I think the best thing, the best answer would be that there is an IMI ethics newsletter, which I am editing at the moment, and I have an al Nadim who supports me in these difficult issues. Uh, you can write to us, to the IMI artist, and we'll then forward it to the relevant Ayatollah, and if we can answer it between the doctors, between the Maulanas who are available easily to us, I mean, Maulana is always very helpful, he helps us a great deal, uh, but there are other ulama also, then we'll forward it to the relevant ulama, and when we go to Kufa and Najaf, inshallah, we're going again in March, we can take a few questions there to the ulama. So, please, please approach IMI uh, through Edinburgh Edinburgh Society, uh, the Edinburgh Edinburgh Society, if you do have any questions, and you know, um, Imamia Medics will be most uh, happy to help people in whatever, um, for whatever advice they need, for whatever you know needs that they may be able to provide through their own resources. On this note, you know, I'd like to thank you so much for coming here, spending a precious Sunday afternoon amongst us. It's been wonderful. I think you know we have to thank Professor Shabi Shabi Hazazeli for yes. giving his time, uh, but also you know I'd like to thank you all on behalf of Mario Medics International for coming here. Uh, let's have a uh,